Hi all, hello, and uh, we are back for another reading of Walking on Cinders. Um, this one nearly didn't happen because I'm uh, I'm pretty ill today, as it turns out. Um, no, I haven't. I haven't got COVID nineteen. Don't worry. Um, it's not that. Um, bizarrely, I have a, an infection in my wisdom tooth of all things that could have happened to me during this time, which meant that I had an emergency. Uh, I won't go into details too much, but I had an emergency. Uh, you know, uh, um, session with a, with a dentist over the phone. They obviously can't see anybody in person at this current time. Uh, they handed me a prescription through a locked door. Um, I really am indebted to the NHS and all the work that they're doing, not only for the people who are suffering from this virus at the moment, but for everything else that's going on as well, because, of course, normal life continues, doesn't it, even though people are facing this uh, horrible virus at the moment. Uh, if you can hear any noise in the background, my housemate is over there sort of doing all sorts of things. He's, he's become a, a regular feature of these videos, so. Afternoon. All right, Gareth. He tells me he likes me to read the story to him because he'd prefer me to read it to him than to read it himself. So, there we go. So this is Walking on Cinders. The book is 10 years old this year. We're on chapter four now, and we pick up the story uh, just after Jennifer arrives at work. Chapter four. Jennifer was suddenly aware of the enormous effect that the terrorist blast on strand sandwiches would now have on her life. She no longer had a full-time job, and that meant no regular dependable wage, and very little means to live by. And she was now on a reformed terrorist group's hit list. He just couldn't bear thinking about. Heading towards Trafalgar Square at the top of the Strand, she pondered over how the morning had progressed. It was still only 12.30, yet the day had passed in the blink of an eye. The strangest thing that Jennifer knew, she would never... The strangest thing was that Jennifer knew she would never see Derek again. It was the way things had to be, if she was to avoid causing any more distress to the people she cared about. For the average business person, shopper or government official who walked the streets of London that morning, or who stood surveying the stone lines at the edge of Nelson's Column, the sight of a young woman dressed in her black and white waitressing penny, with her hair in a mess and tears streaming down her face, running towards St Martin's in the field, would have been a strange one indeed. But, perhaps, simply from their own embarrassment, when the woman stopped by the edge of the pool, they did not even give her the time of day. It seemed to Jennifer that the only alternative to life without regular work and a decent wage was to assume the permanent guise of Miss Marmalade, and that meant giving in to pressure and supporting the United Government. However much Jennifer, However much Jennifer hated the idea, the constant role-playing of fame was not her cup of tea, and she had never been one to gossip or involve herself in serotypous activity, it seemed that all she could do now was to accept the path that had been laid out in front of her and make the best of a bad situation. But then again, if Miss Marmalade was to accept the offer placed before her some weeks ago, she would at least be consistently engaged and would no doubt be well supported in her task, although how she would explain this, the way she was currently dressed to her manager, she did not know. The commanding officer of the Thames Regimental Barracks had an enormous office in the west wing of the complex, it was twice the size of the other rooms, and was fitted out with a decor befitting someone who craved respect and who received it. I am glad to see you got my message, boomed Colonel Smith as he paced up and down the room. You made a very wise decision. You gave us no choice, sir, replied Thomas, as he adjusted his cap so that it shielded his face from the Colonel's staring gaze. Yes, but you are here to protect our great president, aren't you lads? Surely that's enough to spur you on. The Colonel hinted at a smile, but it never appeared. I still prefer to call it Queen and Country, Chris broke in bitterly. He'd been in this situation many times before and therefore knew exactly what he could get away with. Ah, but Staff Sergeant Aston, the booming voice sounded again. You need to stop living in the past, my friend. The President has been in power for a long time now. The people of this great country voted for the right to become a republic and so we provided it. It wasn't hard to jettison Queen Beatrice, silly girl. This is not the Second World War, Christopher, and you need to start realising that. Colonel Smith loved to give speeches, and this was no exception. Chris, however, had already prepared a retort. You mean the same people of this country who voted for a change in name, and for an alliance with other nations that split the world in two, leading to an outrageous war which could easily have been avoided, he spat, wondering how far he could push it. His comrades looked on in amazement, and hoped that this downright patriotism would not alter the Colonel's plans. Chris continued, I agree with you about Beatrice. She wanted a lifestyle of privilege and wasn't bothered about the people, but when I was brought up, King Henry was still in power and he had to deal with the hideous royal hover crash. I know that people rebelled against the monarchy and saw Buckingham Palace as a focus of their anger, 
But in history, at past paper level, we learned about Queen Elizabeth II, and I believe she was one of the greatest monarchs we ever had. You have strong beliefs, smiled the colonel, but let's not get this in the way of what I've called you here for today. Staff Sergeant Aston, Corporal Roberts and Private Fisher, you may well become the saviours of our country in the next posting you go on. How does that sound? Interesting came to mind, but so did many other words, Chris thought. But we've only just returned from a posting, sir. Surely you can't send us back so soon? I mean, we're on leave, said Thomas, ever the optimist. I'm afraid this is rather more serious than that. You see, this morning the far end of the Strand was blown to pieces by a terrorist bomb... I was there this morning. I passed by on my way here, broke in Ewan, cutting the colonel off in his prime. It was a terrible sight. I couldn't believe it. He finished and noticed Chris gesture to them both to remain quiet. As I was saying, Colonel Smith continued, we consider this plot to be a mixed message from the enemy. Already it is clear that the attack was not sanctioned by a direct chain of command linking all of the reformed nations, and therefore we believe it to be a specific deterrent to the completion of our future aims. In short, we know that reformed troops are fighting a losing battle against the United Lands of America in the Middle East. Meanwhile, the President of this great United Republic, along with the French government, has been amending plans for a full-scale offensive in central France, which aims to flush out the enemy fractions that remain there. This, when synchronised with battles and airstrikes across the globe, is intended to bring an end to the war once and for all. Recently, reformed spies got wind of our plans, and by striking the strand with a suicide attack, the enemy are effectively forcing us to launch our plans far earlier than we anticipated. They believe this will give their weakened forces a dynamic advantage. For a moment, the free soldiers contemplated the importance of the situation. The last push, the light at the end of a tunnel. But how does this involve us? Thomas piped up, asking the question that was on everyone's lips. Aye, well, the colonel replied a little apprehensively, the president has asked for good soldiers to lead the attack in France. The head of the armed forces approached me and I identified yourselves as candidates. The Thames Regiment has a history of great success, and with Staff Sergeant Aston as your leader, I'm sure you will be successful. A large number of our boys are already based in the area to which you will be heading, a mixed barracks in the Auverge region, and they will soon be joined by those from the United Lands of America, and of course from Europe. Chris thought this through silently, and looked at the others. Thomas appeared to be hiding under the peak of his cap again, while Ewan had turned pale. Chris himself, however, was almost excited about the whole idea. To him, it was a chance that he had been waiting for. A chance to lead and for others to follow. His chance to prove that he was good enough for the SAS. But sir, he began, forcing the quick discussion of an issue which confused him. Why launch an attack in central France? Surely just by breaching the United Defences and moving towards central Averge region, the reformed enemy has succeeded in their aims to move closer to our government and its intelligence. For a few seconds, Colonel Smith hesitated, looking around the room from one soldier to the next, before replying, Well, he began, before taking another long pause, You are right in many ways, Aston. However, there comes a time to show the enemy what you are really made of. The fractions of the reformed army that exist in an isolated area in central France pose no threat to the greater democracy of the United World. In many ways, they are cut off from their superiors, having been surrounded in recent weeks by a variety of special united forces, in the same way as the region itself is cut off from the rest of France. Chris nodded. He saw this as a reasonable explanation. What we really need are soldiers like you who can fly into the very heart of the Averge region and flush out these rebels. Dispatching as many as possible and forcing the others towards the borders of Switzerland and Germany, where they will be met by a further influx of our troops from the very eastern edge of the United Governance. Nearly three centuries after the Victorian Empire, its lasting effect on London was still visible on Drury Lane. The large red brick facades and stone arches marked the edge of the pavement, and the buildings that were found here were now so rare that the whole street had been designated a World Heritage Site, the designs written into the history books. There was a theatre on the street too, a very famous theatre, and one of the last. It too had been built out of red brick, and a shower of tiny lights glowed in the evening just above the entrance, to announce whatever was showing. Above the posters and the tiny neon lights was a small window. It had a red wooden frame and went unnoticed by those passing by on the street below. But... But it let in a little light into a dark room, a room that housed a table and two worn-out chairs. It was a room that could only be reached via a small flight of stairs at the back of the theatre, and on the door, which opened with a heavy sigh, was a single brass nameplate. 
Jennifer peered at the name and smiled. She had been here so many times before, and the thought that the little old man with the balding head still believed he was the best agent in London never ceased to make her smile. Half an hour earlier she had been crying her eyes out in Trafalgar Square, but from the moment she stepped beyond this door she would have to take on and com- have to take on composure and the attitude of her famous alter ego. Pushing the door open, she looked into a dingy room and was met by a very familiar face. Miss Marmalade, spoke the broad Irish accent. What a nice surprise. But oh, what is this you are wearing? Could it be a new costume from your repertoire? Oh, you you might say that, Miss Marmalade replied, little on edge. She hinted at a smile and immediately her confidence grew. Well, I like it, I like it, her manager replied. Change is always a good thing and with your ascending stardom, how could others not agree? But take a seat, take a seat and tell me, why do you call upon me so early in the day? Miss Marmalade pulled out one of the battered chairs and sat closer to the desk. She took a fleeting glance out of the window and down to the street below. There was an abnormally large number of people pacing up and down Drury Lane, the outpouring from the first terrorist attack on the city in a generation. Not wanting to think about her current situation, Miss Marmalade turned away, leaned in close and started to speak in that soft, subtle voice with which she managed to seduce all the soldier boys. Yet there was something new in her tone, perhaps a hint of desperation. I need a favour, she spoke, her lips barely moving. There's been some trouble for me recently, something I don't want to go into. But I need to get out of here. I I need permanent work. For a moment, she wondered if she had come on too strong. Would her agent question why things were not right? It was no wonder, she breathed a quick sigh of relief then, when he smiled his trademark smile and looked her up and down. Well, I know you're not well enough to ask. Well, I know you well enough not to ask, darling. There's uh, no shortage of projects for someone of your persona. The ageing man paused for a moment, imagining he saw an invisible wall which had appeared between himself and the beautiful girl he managed. There are many, many offers arriving in my inbox each and every day. Most of them I ignore, but as your wishes have now changed, I will look at them in a different light. Of course, I have kept the President's personal request open. Perhaps you could take a little time to consider it now your situation has changed. As I said before... I'm not struck on the idea, but I need something fast, Miss Marmalade replied a little too quickly. The manager raised his eyebrows and then shuffled some of the papers on his desk. But if you think it's my only option, a smile lit up her manager's face. I'm saying you should consider it. The president has asked for you specifically. At any rate, we can discuss it further at tonight's performance. It's a uh, birthday party, I believe. Yes. And at this theatre? Yes. So everything seems to be in order now? Yes. Good. Good. It seemed strange to Jennifer as she left the front steps of the theatre behind and made her way back to the flat on the edge of the entertainment district that the meeting with Miss Marmalade's manager had even taken place at all. He hadn't cottoned on to what was happening, but Jennifer still couldn't stop herself from dwelling on the thoughts of the cafe. Nothing that serious had happened to her before, and she was thankful for it. Now, though, things had changed. Within days she could be far away, in the desert or on the very edge of the Arctic, entertaining the troops or the land armies. One thing was certain, the proposition which had been made by the President's personal secretary almost a month ago was ludicrous. She would never accept, as it would make her an instant target. The last thing she wanted was to put her life on the line. In fact, it was downright scary. And yet the thought of new work and new horizons excited and thrilled her at the same time.